Steve, I have a confession to make. And I said, what? And he said, I've never sung with an orchestra in my life. I've just sung with a trio or a quartet, and then I'd go home and they'd bring the musicians in and overdub. And if I don't like what I hear, I've never heard a Billy Goldenberg arrangement. Uh, I've never sung with all these musicians here. And if I don't like the sound, you have to promise me right now you'll send everybody home and just keep the rhythm section. And I promised him. I, I told him at the very beginning we, we met that I would never make him do anything that he didn't want to do. So I promised him. Elvis walked into the studio with all the guys, walked up to Billy Goldenberg's conductor stand like an apple cart and never looked back. He loved everything that he heard. And as soon as the downbeat happened, uh, you know, it changed his whole, he couldn't get enough musicians when he went to Las Vegas. I think the TCB <laughs> band was bigger than ours. But, uh, you know, Billy is just a very special person and I'm so happy that uh, Billy is stripped. I hired Billy Strange to do this show, and Billy Strange had just got a hit record with Nancy Sinatra called These Boots Are Made For Walking," and the record company was insisting he finish an album. So after weeks of begging him to focus on Elvis, he was busy with Nancy. So I gave him a deadline, and I said, you're not here by Monday with lead sheets so we can start rehearsals, you're fired. And he said, you can't fire me. I said, why not? He said, because you don't know Elvis. I do. I'm friends with Elvis. And I said, well, Billy, one of us is going to go, but you're fired if Monday I don't get my arrangements. Monday came around, I didn't get my arrangements, and I fired him. <laughs> Elvis came in, and he said, what happened? And I explained to him exactly what, what I'm telling you now. And he said, oh, that makes sense, okay. And then he just... But I didn't have a musical director, so I called up Billy in New York, and I said, Billy, you've got to get on an airplane today and come to LA, he was in New York, and be the conductor and the arranger of the Elvis Presley special. And Billy said, I can't. And I said, why not? He said, because I'm a Jewish kid from New York, and, and uh, I, I'm on Broadway. I, I don't see myself conducting Hound Dog in blue suede shoes. <laughs> and I said, Billy, I'm on my hands and knees in LA on the phone begging you to get on a plane and come here. And thank God he did. So I just wanted you to know that. <laughs> now, the closing song was incredible because Colonel Parker was throwing fits throughout the entire production that he didn't get his Christmas song. <laughs> Where's my Christmas song? And at one point he said, okay, I've made a decision. I want you, Elvis, to close the show with uh, an old 1950s Frankie Lane song called I Believe. And I, I like the song. I mean, when I listen to it, uh, I believe that every drop of rain that falls, the flower grows. And I said, Colonel Parker, what does this have to do with Christmas? And he said, it's a Christmas song, just do it. <laughs> so I called uh, Billy and Earl Brown into my office, and I said, guys, we now know Elvis Presley. You know, he's not that image that we all kind of conceived in the beginning, a kid coming from the Deep South, Tupelo, Mississippi, and uh, you know, he's, he, we've all had our chance to be with Elvis one-on-one. -on -one. We now know what he stands for. Uh, I need you to go home and write the greatest song you've ever written. And the lyrics have to describe exactly who Elvis Presley is. That's the assignment. They went home, and I got a phone call. And I think it was the middle of the night saying, we think we got it. Can you come in early tomorrow and we'll play it for you? So I came to NBC, uh, walked into Elvis's dressing room. Nobody was there except uh, the two of them. And they sat down at the piano. Earl had a beautiful voice being choral director. 
the late, unbelievable piano player. He and Michelle Legrand used to play all the time for fun on dual pianos. And they played If I Can Dream. Well, I have a kind of an instinctive feeling after maybe four bars, whether I like it or I don't like it, I instantly loved it. So when Elvis showed up, I took Elvis into his dressing room. Uh, we had an outer office, so to speak, and uh, we had a piano in there in the bedroom section of the dressing room, and then we had the, the uh, entrance. And I uh, closed the door, we went to the piano, and uh, Elvis said, what's this? And I said, this is your closing song. And uh, so Earl sang the lyrics, Billy played the piano, listened to it, looked at me and said, do it again. And so they, they played it typically with Elvis. He needed four or five consecutive plays to really get into the song. And he looked at, now in the meantime, I'm hearing Colonel Parker walk in and say, over my dead body, is he ever gonna sing that song on the television show? He's gonna do a Christmas song. And uh, Elvis looks at me and he says, I like it, I'm, I'll do it. The minute he said, I'll do it, the door bursts open, in comes Colonel Parker with Freddie Beanstalk, his publishing guy, with a contract in their hand for Billy and Earl to sign. <laughs> so anyway, this is Billy Goldenberg. This is the integrity of my whole staff. Billy walks over to the lead sheet, which says music by Billy Goldenberg, lyrics by Earl Brown, takes an eraser and erases his name off of the lead sheet. That cost Billy a fortune. Oh. And he said, I can't take credit for this. Earl Brown wrote the words and the music. And uh, that became the backstory of the final song of the show, which in a sense, as much as Earl wrote the lyrics, Elvis wrote the lyrics because all he was doing is translating what we knew about Elvis Presley. So here it is.